out in 20 minutes. I think we'll do our first segment and then go look and see what the situation is and then move uh, down there. <laughs> I think we were in here I for classes once before and we outgrew it. And it looks like we're about right tonight. Some people will probably not find us. Anyway, let's uh, do the best that we can with this uh, situation here. Um, people have the handouts um, there. You will notice that that's what I need this morning. Oh, I have. Oh, that's what I'm speaking about. Yes. <laughs> better serious off there. <laughs> <coughs> Important things to do there. Um, well, the first thing is to notice I uh, changed the title tonight as I've been thinking about this throughout the week. I think there's a whole problem that's come to me in little different ways, I think healthier ways. I think we were calling it before a search for peace in the midst of guilt. And I sort of modified that title now to trying to uncover the obstacles that might be in the way of becoming the kind of person we would like to be. And I'll remind you that the kind of person we'd like to be, as we've been talking about it, is uh, someone who is alive and with it. When we're talking about the spiritually mature pe person, I think we have someone in mind who has achieved a sense of integration in their life. Let's wholeness who has things together. I think of the spiritually alive person as uh, being able to make a difference in our world, of having a certain power to influence things. I think of the spiritually alert person as having a strength, uh, an ability to withstand uh, the icy blasts that are bound to come at us. The spiritually mature person has a perspective on things. They try not to get bent out of shape over small things that are problem areas. Now, in other words, there's a picture that I hope sort of emerges throughout this whole series of lectures of what we might want to be like. Now, uh, I always go back to Irenaeus' phrase that the glory of God is the human person fully alive. The fully alive person is perhaps what we have in mind. A lot of times what we end up doing when is to get models of this. We, that's one of the reasons we have the saints. I was talking to someone today who was saying, well, we need a revival of interest in the saints. A lot of times I've done these lectures on great people. Uh, and the purpose of that is to be able to put flesh and blood on these ideals that we talk about so that we have sort of a picture, an image of what it would be like to be spiritually integrated in a lot. And of course, for us Christians, when we come down to it, uh, the real model for all of this, uh, our exemplar, is Jesus of Nazareth. So that it's important to be able to think of Jesus of Nazareth as a human person, as one who struggled with life as we do. And to be able to pick out of those gospel scenes uh, an image of Jesus as being a faithful servant, as being a companion passionate individual, as having his head together, as knowing just how to deal with people, knowing how to do the fitting thing in any situation, a person who did make a difference in the small circle that he called his world there, a person who eventually made a difference in the whole of the cosmos. So we try to get an image, picture of what a spiritually alive person is all about. Now, the problem tonight is as I see it, to uncover for ourselves, and again, a very personal kind of reflection, uncover the obstacles to that. What keeps us from achieving that kind of uh, spiritual awakening? What gets in the way of it all? And that becomes a very personal reflection because we're all going to find our own uh, little problem areas, difficulties, things that keep us from becoming the mature person that we really would like to be. Now, the sequence of, of the topic is sort of important, and I'm jumping off here from uh, something that Rahner wrote in a meditation or a retreat he gave to priests. And uh, uh, Rahner did that a lot. He usually modeled those on the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius, and I find some of his most penetrating psychological insights in all of his writing come in those um, 
retreats that he gives. You find it in a book called The Priesthood or Priestly Life as it's translated in some circles and also another book called A Commentary on the Spiritual Exercises. Uh, the first quote on your paper is from uh, one of those retreats. Um, anyway, what Rahner says is when you st want to start looking at this whole question that the beginning point is not to ask in what ways I'm sinful. He said if we start out with that, we're going to miss a whole lot that's important about ourselves and what obstacles there are to human growth. He says don't make the first question, you know, do I really love God or not? Or am I moving towards holiness or not? Or how, in what ways am I sinful? He says that will... Uh, get us in trouble right off the bat. So, what he does suggest to us is a very dispassionate kind of search. He thinks that at the, at the beginning of this whole business, we ought to turn off the emotion a little bit and try to get clear-sighted uh, to let our head take over for a while in order to begin to examine the obstacles to spiritual growth. And the first place that he wants us to look now is what um, he calls a sort of distortion in our outlook. He wants us to begin with the ways in which we're not quite put together right, and the ways in which um, our attitudes are skewed, the ways in which uh, we find some what we might call personality quirks or foibles or disorders in the way we end up responding to life. It is in modern language to try to find how we are infected with false consciousness. That's a phrase that goes back to Hegel at the beginning of the 19th century and um, in many ways it really captures what I'm talking about. To have false consciousness is me means that we just simply look at our world in a faulty way. This doesn't have anything to do, first of all, with sin or guilt or anything like that. It's got to do with the bad ways we perceive ourselves, other people, our culture, and the world as a whole. False consciousness is what Rahner says we need to unmask first. We're going to find out what's keeping us from being fully alive and becoming the kind of person that we would really like to be. Now, one of the things that causes false consciousness, of course, is the culture in which we live. And we got a graphic example of this. If anybody saw 60 Minutes this last Sunday, they did the story from India, and if you didn't see it, I'll fill you in on it, but the story comes from India of the situation there with the young brides. The young brides are to bring a dowry to their marriage, and um, they are treated, I mean, almost as chattel as uh, they're preparing for this marriage. The man is supposed to be totally in charge and have this sort of macho image and so on, and the young woman is supposed to be sub totally passive and submissive and play that role to the hilt. Not only that, but the family has to get all of this, uh, their wealth together, get everything to throw into the dowry in order to make this marriage work. But then they detailed the problem as being even worse than that because then after the marriage occurs, very often the groom's family or the groom himself begins to put more pressure on the bride's family to give more money for the dowry. And the ter horrible thing that they talked about was when that could not be accomplished, it was fairly common simply to douse the bride with kerosene and to burn her up. Now it appears as though people do this, um, you know, without great compunction or without any tremendous guilt feelings or anything. It simply becomes a way of life in India. I mean, it's just sort of done that way. Now here we have an example of a whole culture producing what we, from our perspective, would call false consciousness. No, it's not clear that even those people perpetrating this horrible crime are sinning. 
it's not clear at all. In fact, one would have to call that into great doubt. One has to wonder about that. They are simply doing what is doing. Somebody, they were saying, well, why do they do that? Why don't they go through a divorce? They said, well, it's so much easier just to burn her up to buy the kerosene. It's easier to buy the kerosene than to go through a divorce. So, I mean, we're dealing here, you see, with a whole cultural milieu that sets up a situation like this where this becomes possible. Now, you can begin to... Multi see, it's easy standing in our culture to look at another culture and see the distortion. <clears throat> False consciousness occurs when you're inside of the culture and one is not able to sort of work out of it. One isn't able to rise above it or see through it. Many people, I've used this example, I just came to my mind, I usually say whatever comes to my mind. <laughs> But I mean, I remember as a young priest, you know, falling into this trap. There was a, a very good friend of mine who lived in a rectory situation. It was just a horrible situation. Uh, the pastor was mentally ill. He was an alcoholic. Um, it was a terrible situation. And the pastor used to uh, uh, do things like uh, listen in on his phone conversations or walk right up to him in the middle of mass and tell him he wasn't doing right or... He would uh, wake him up at 3 a.m. and tell him to take a different mass in the morning. I mean, it was just a horrible situation. Now, I used to drive to where this uh, priest lived and sort of get him out of the house sometime. We'd go out to a movie or talk or something, get him out. And when it was time to go back, he would just shake going back in there. And, you know, my big bit was to get him out of there for a few minutes and uh, send him back in and try to straighten him out and so on. Today, that sounds utterly ridiculous to me. From my vantage point today, all I can say about that, that was just utter folly. We should have got the guy out of there. Today, there's a simple thing to go out and live in an apartment. You know, we're done a lot of other, I mean, we did other things like go to the bishop and try to straighten it out. We did all kind of things like that. But we all worked in trying to solve the problem within that given system. And it was a system in which priests lived in rectories never dawned on me to speak very personally to get them out of there and have them live someplace else from my vantage point today that becomes false consciousness i didn't help my friend um can't do much about it now either because he's dead um i think that whole experience has had something to do with it uh it's uh so i mean we're not dealing with uh, minor matters here but again, I tell the personal example to say that when we're caught up in a situation, when we live in a culture, I was living in the clerical culture where it never dawned on me there was a better solution to the problem. Just like the young women in, in India were trying to raise the consciousness of people and say, hey, there's a better way of doing this than burning up young women with uh, limited dowry. So that's one thing that one has to, I think, I've seen the culture very often, uh, I think, programs the false consciousness. No, it also, I think, comes very often from family situations. Here I'm thinking of a young woman in my uh, honors program, I think it was just uh, last uh, year, the honors class and so on, we were talking a lot about male-female relationships and so on. And young woman uh, said that you know all her life her mother programmed her for one thing that was to catch a man and that's just the way about the way it was put she was taught to behave around men in a certain way that that was the only thing that was really important in her life that's what it was all about that was the name of the game to be able to attract and get a man in her life and this young woman, a college student, I think she's a few years older than the average college senior, if I'm not mistaken, but she was telling the class openly, outwardly, uh, about how her consciousness was raised and how she now thought that was a whole ridiculous game that she had been playing. But her family had put that sort of false consciousness on her 
and it was only in the light of more years and uh, a lot of difficult situations and so on, a lot of psychic pain and hurt, that she came to the conclusion that that didn't really make any sense, and it wasn't a particularly good way to live. Now, I've dealt with a lot of other people who were never able to break out of that kind of false consciousness. I can think of people I've dealt with over long periods of time trying to suggest to them that that precise kind of family training does not make a lot of reasonable sense. There ought to be another way to live life and to relate to the opposite sex and so on, and, um, but with absolutely no success in changing the consciousness. In other words, some people just find themselves imprisoned in that and never really, I suppose, can rise above it in any way. Now, the other sort of false consciousness that arises, it seems to me, is personal. That is, for one reason or another, we begin to look at ourselves, assess ourselves, in a way that's not in touch with reality. I suppose I'm flashing in this again how surprising it is to me often to encounter women who are very attractive but who don't think of themselves that way and are convinced precisely that they are not. I mean, I've seen that so much that I mean, I just begin to wonder what kind of sort of false consciousness you know, it ends up being put upon me. And I, I think that's cultural, and I don't want to move away from my, my category here, and I think it does, matter because I think that problem is clearly cultural. It's because people don't measure up to some sort of idealized image of female beauty in the culture. But it does have that very personal element that someone's walking around all of the time who is attractive, but not feeling that way, not thinking about themselves that way, and not acting out of that kind of conviction. The negative things take over. Now you can uh, extend that example to so many other ways in which people will end up saying, well, I'm no good at this. No, I, I couldn't speak up in this group because I have nothing to say. Whereas, objectively speaking, if you had five people judge what the person said and intervened in the group would say, oh, that's good, that was very nice, a helpful contribution, so on. Yet that person sitting there thinking, I have nothing to say. This is an example, again, I suppose, of a sort of personalized false consciousness. I suppose to make that a generalized point, it seems to me that so many people end up focusing so much on their negative qualities, the things that are wrong, that very often they end up not being able to see the positive, the good things that are present there. So all of these things are um, ways of trying to get at this question of false consciousness. No. Either the culture programs us to distort the reality, or maybe it's family training that uh, limits our ability to understand who we are, or for very personalized reasons, we simply have a distorted self-image. All of those things become obstacles to growth, as long as we're imprisoned in those uh, inadequate ways of thinking, we can't function. We can't become the fully alive kind of person. Now, I'd like to take just a little break there, and uh, maybe we can uh, spend a minute um, checking out our... I'd like to invite people to do a minute of silence. And it's really an invitation to do something on false consciousness to see it, what, what bells that rings. I mean, if it was truly false consciousness and describing it, maybe we couldn't find out what it was anyway that we were trying to do. In other words, what we were trying to figure out is how why we got distorted thinking in the culture from our families within our own hearts. Now, obviously, some people could do it by saying, well, here's a way I found false consciousness in the past in my life. And now I've been able somehow to rise above that. That gives me a feel for it. 
Now we get back to the thing that I think Rahner was telling us at the beginning that you're going to need some clear thinking on this because it's not going to be an easy thing to do. I mean, you take those young men in India who are burning brides, they say, you know, what about this? The guy says, well, everyone burns brides. I mean, what's your problem? See, it, it, again, we've got the problem of getting back from it and allowing ourselves in one way or another to um, learn and to get in touch with things. And not only that, are they, are they <laughs> it's awfully warm in here, isn't it? That's one good reason for moving. I think it would be good at this point for us to all go back to the auditorium. Let's do that. to make the point of the difficulty involved in uncovering that and dealing with it because the pr problem is precisely that one is imprisoned in a way of thinking and has trouble breaking out of it. So now we got to talk a little bit about how we might do that, what techniques or tools might be available to try to uh, improve our self-image, our image of the world, and our relationships, and so on. The first point is to repeat what I said at the beginning, and that is that to get involved in guilt feelings uh, will not help. Because if we're once enmeshed in sort of a cycle of guilt and trying to get uh, wonder why we're not doing better or improving in life or living more up to our ideals, then we are simply never going to see clearly enough to break out of it. The guilt will simply turn us in and in on ourselves more. We end up spiraling downward and unable to catch the clues around that would allow us to break out of uh, the, the uh, false consciousness that's imprisoning us. So we're back then to trying to get beyond that emotion and trying to get a sort of a clear-headed view of who we are and where we would like to go. Now, second point. It is helpful in this to look at other people because it will give us a concrete feel for, what, for how other people are messed up. Now, that, this is not meant to be judgmental or anything. In fact, it's something that we do a lot of, and I think it's done with fair charity. In other words, I think sometimes we look at people and we say, geez, he's really a nice guy, you know, but he's just got no social skills. He just can't talk to anybody. I, I don't think we, it's not necessarily a put down. I mean, we're not saying he's a sinner. We're not saying he's a bad person. We say he's a nice guy, but he just can't handle that. Or we say about somebody else says, geez, she's a, She's a nice person. I like to be around her and everything, but she just lacks self-confidence. Oh, she, she's too diffident. She's too timid. Gee, I just like to shake her and get her out of herself and so on. And we don't mean it. it. It doesn't seem to me. I mean, sometimes that is pure gossip and uncharitableness. I agree with that. But there's another way in which we do it. It simply reveals that we think the person is morally good that they're on the right track, they got goodwill, but for one reason or another, they're not all that we'd like them to be. Well, we think of that, just if, if he would just uh, take some classes and learn how to talk better, he'd be terrific. You know, very often it's that kind of hope for people. We'd say, boy, if they just uh, get hold of themselves here and uh, try to improve in this way, then they would make a much better influence on their family. Or if that father would just learn how to talk to his kids, just to show them some affection, if he could just learn to hug his kids, that doesn't seem so hard, but he's so stiff around them, he can't seem to let go, and they sense that, and that hurts the relationship. Nice father, good man, loves his kids, but he just can't hug them. That's what I like to do is just loosen them up so he could hug them. You know? Big bear hug. So, what, what's helpful about this is not to point out other people's faults and so on. It's to throw it back and say, that's probably what someone else would say about me. 
you know, in all like it, I'm sitting and saying, I, I'm of goodwill, I'm trying, you know, I'm doing this right, I'm trying to do this right and everything, but from the inside, I can't see what other people would see. I don't want to sit there and say, Jesus, if he just wouldn't yell so much, you know, if he just dressed decently, I could listen to him better. That's my father always would say, do you have to be the worst dressed priest? <laughs> I don't care, you don't have to be a fox, but you can't be the worst dress. Um, sort of nice to have people around who, uh, you know, are like that, I suppose. So, with, well, with the purpose of this part of the exercise is to pr figure out that if we can see that in other people, then probably it's true about ourselves, too. All of us can figure on the fact that we got distorted ways of looking at the world, that keep us from being effective, keep us from uh, spreading the kingdom, keep us from really being imitators of Jesus Christ. You can count on it. Right? So Isaac says, I can see it in everybody else, it must be in me. Thirdly, we need to take seriously the patterns of criticism that come our way. The patterns, now I mean, I think that it's important not to be so thin-skinned that every little thing someone says to us, we fall apart, you know? I mean, I just don't like your hairdo, and then it ruins your day or something, you know? Couldn't stand the cake. <laughs> I mean, you know, it, it just, we have to be careful of that, and I think the natural tendency is for many of us is to take, uh, you know, sort of honest criticism uh, as a personal aid. As though the person is saying to us, you're a bad person, or I don't like you. And I believe that that we would need to get around. This whole thing isn't going to work if we get fixated there, if we're that thin-skinned. And you can see that happen all the time. I mean, someone wants to offer an honest criticism, honest help, and the person ends up being feeling like they're knifed right here. You know? Jeez, shouldn't have called that time out there, Tim. You call that time out a stupid time in that game. You know, and so uh, Tim's a coach, so he's sitting there thinking, geez, you know, if he lets that get to him, well, then he's messed up. So we can't let that happen. But what I would be looking for, rather, is the pattern of criticism, the pattern of feedback that we get, especially from the people that uh, like us or care about us. Now, that might be worth considering. Now, if no one ever gives us any criticism, then we're probably in big trouble because we can't, we're losing one of the big tools we have for figuring out how we're imprisoned in false consciousness. That's one of the things that friends should do for one another is be willing to share with the other uh, what might be wrong here. So, you know, I'm thinking about this. So my spiritual director tells me I'm a workaholic. People say to me, well, why don't you ever take a vacation? Everyone who sees me says, well, you look too tired. Well, um, well, I keep hearing this from everybody, you know. Well, after a while, a pattern emerges. Now, all those people happen to be wrong. You know? <laughs> In this case, I'm just using it as an example, you know, of a pattern of criticism. All those people do not know what they're talking about, you know. If they really knew... <laughs> They wouldn't tell me these things. Well, um, but for other people, should look at the pattern of criticism. So when my uh, spiritual director, <laughs> when my spiritual director says, you know, uh, you got to take a break here, you got to take time out. You know, normal people don't work that long. Um, well, then sooner or later. I probably have to start to listen to that. You know, sooner or later, a, a, a smart, put it this way, a smart man, would, a uh, wise person would sooner or later let that message penetrate. So we got a pattern of criticism here. Of course, you have to work on that. I mean, we have to say, a boy just getting bent out of shape over little things, let's not take them all personally, but let's try to see what major things people say to me about the way I live my life and how I might try to end up doing better. Fourth, we need to listen to the prophets 
in our midst, in our culture. Now this is really tricky, of course, because the problem is to figure out who the prophets are. One of the ways we learn this is in retrospect. You see, I studied under a man by the name of Bernard Herring in the late 60s, great moral theologian. And Bernard Herring always used to tell us, we are bound up in the church in legalism. We're just too legalistic. We're too much centered on keeping the rules. We're too big on always keeping all the rules, especially in the United States. Says that he gave the Pope Paul VI his first retreat. Father Bernard Herring did. He was an important figure, architect of the section on marriage in the Second Vatican Council. And, and he's saying this, he says, especially in the United States, you people are even overly legalistic, more so than Rome. You know, the common thing is to say that uh, people in Rome, they make all those church laws, and the only ones who really take them seriously are the people in the United States. And over there, they know you're not supposed to take them all that seriously. <laughs> well, they just got their simple ways of getting around them all. But uh, here, we have gotten this strange idea of taking all those things seriously. So Father Herring says, we're too legalistic. Well, I tell you the truth, I think I'm still learning that message now. I consider to be Herring to be a prophet. I think time has proven that he's right, but you know, I can still see little ways in which, in my, at least my own thinking, that would creep in. And so that one has to uh, try to rise above the legalism. But Herring would turn out to be a prophet. Now, some people's consciousness on that point is not raised yet. Now, I can say that. And some people are still imprisoned in legalisms with the church, you know, are hung up on all the rules and so on, excessively so. They need to hear that. They could think about the message of Herring, and they could ask themselves then, because he's proclaimed it, and a lot of other people have picked it up, they could ask themselves, well, geez, maybe I'm that way. Maybe I'm in prison in a false, legalistic consciousness here. Well, let's take something like uh, Dr. Martin Luther King's work. Now, a lot of us would end up thinking that Dr. King was a prophet, that he saw the distortions in the society on racial questions. He saw how segregation hurt white people as much as black people how we all suffered because of that. And uh, so many people, I mean, just never could see that. I was uh, so taken by the movie, uh, what is it, A Soldier's Story? Some people have seen it. Powerful film on this. Because from our vantage point today, what was the time setting? I'm forgetting, 1930 something. 30s in the South. Yeah, well anyway, I mean the language in relationship to the blacks is just striking. I mean, you know, even the guys who are sort of of goodwill and want to be nice to the blacks around, their language is so demeaning. You no, know, even for a nigger you know a lot or something. It's just, um, it, and for, it's just jarring to us because our consciousness has been raised on that kind of question. Flashing on another movie, Little Big Man, where you see it from the viewpoint of the Indian, and the Indians are saying, talking about the white people as barbarians, as savages. Because the white people are coming in and killing them, and taking their land. And from their viewpoint, they're sitting there talking very seriously about those savages. Well, that is striking, because everybody in the United States grows up watching movies in which it's the Indians who are the savages, who are the bad people. Along that line, someone once said, what do you think it sounded like uh, to an Indian if he hears someone say, Columbus discovered America? I mean, I'm talking about an Indian lived in the United States, I mean, in, in America. I mean, it's a little, I mean, it's a natural response. What do you mean he discovered it? We were right here, you know? <laughs> I mean, why do you say he discovered it? We've been here for a long time. I mean, it makes no sense from their frame of reference. So, Martin Luther King, I'm putting him forward as a consciousness raiser on the racial question, trying to look at the movies to say how they would uh, influence us. So then it's a question of, you know, how much are we still caught up in a false 
outlook on people of different races. Now let's take um, the uh, question of um, Daniel Berrigan on the question of violence. Now I noticed an interesting thing recently. Berrigan was critical of the Nicaraguan uh, situation of the government there. Berrigan was critical of Ernesto Cardinal down in South America for being too caught up in the Sandinista regime of not keeping critical distance. And Berrigan says, um, well, I, you know, it's not right. They have no room for conscientious objection. They're conscripting everybody now, you know. And there's no room for conscientious objection. And Berrigan, standing outside of the Sandinista situation, is pleading with Cardinal and some of those other people. We know we have priests and the thing, the guy you keep seeing on television these days, uh, who said today that that's a lot of bullshit, what the United States said. He's a priest. And uh, those are the people that the Pope waved his finger at when he was down there, when they were kneeling on the ground and telling them, whatever, get out of government, I think, is what he was saying. Remember that scene, the Pope, the guy's kneeling? Berrigan, you know, is trying to adopt a position of no violence of any kind. You know, he's saying that as soon as you get caught up in violence, you're going to lose. And so from his vantage point, he wants to critique those people in Nicaragua, the church people who maybe are just not being critical enough of some of the policies of the Sandinista government. And finally, when I'm looking at these prophets, I'll pick out an unlikely group of prophets. And that is the Catholic bishops of the United States. Now, we don't usually think of bishops as being prophetic, but uh, on many of the social stands they have taken lately, it seems to me that's exactly the role they are playing. They're trying to get us to stop and think about the culture in which we live. I think from the vantage point of history, we will see the bishops were very enlightened people in this period. For example, they opposed capital punishment. I presume some people will be sitting around someday in the United States of America and they'll be sitting there and they say, now you're not going to believe this, but they used to execute people. They used to inject them in their veins or put them in a chair and pass electricity through them. I don't have much doubt that some people someday in the United States will be sitting around saying, can you imagine? you believe this, that people were that barbaric? And other people would say, well, I don't believe that. That probably never happened. Well, that's my own opinion. Other people have different opinion about that. But uh, I'm saying that, that from the vantage point now, I, I would like to think that very often the bishops are saying a prophetic word to the culture. The point of all of this is that if we're going to avoid false consciousness, we got to be listening to these potential prophetic voices around us. Now, that's not going to be simple. I mean, you can't just sit there and say, yeah, the bishops are right in the new document on economy. I mean, that requires much more sober, careful thinking than that. But I think a wise person would be at least thinking, maybe there's a critique of capitalism here, our economic system that I ought to look at or somehow check out. Okay, that was the fourth point. Listen to the prophets in the culture. Five, learn to see the false patterns in our own thinking which take us in a negative direction. In other words, what I'd like to do here is say, you know, what i got to see is wh what about the patterns of my responses that prove to be destructive? They prove not to work out. They either make strained relationships or they turn off people, or later on I have to end up apologizing, or it doesn't do any good, it doesn't help the culture, it's destructive in some way. In other words, I gotta get at the thinking that stands behind this. Uh, sometimes I like to talk about this um, in therapeutic terms. There's an interesting book out called Feeling Good by a fellow by the name of Burns. Some people know that book. Well, I, I think that Burns has some good thinking in that book because what he gets people to do is sort of set up a chart of their poor patterns of thought. 
No, when uh, someone uh, makes a mistake and then they end up saying, geez, I'm nothing but a klutz, I do everything wrong. Well, there is a logical fallacy in that. The logical fallacy is that one has taken one particular incident and universalized it, which is not really a fair thing to do. That is uh, a lack of logical precision. So what the person should say is, I did this one bad thing, I feel bad about it, but I also do many other good things. That would be a much more precise and logical way to proceed. So that what this whole therapy is designed to do is to uncover the patterns of poor thinking. The usual logical fallacies I have, and then to try to break through that to try to say, train myself, it's a very um, definite way of proceeding, to train myself to get on alert when the false pattern is coming. Oh, universalizing again. Universalizing, I, I am taking one negative thing and blowing it out of proportion, I can't do that. So that one tries to train oneself to think in a clearer kind of way. Let me, um, I think, stay with the same point and try to, to get at it another way yet. And that is what I would usually need to do in all of this is to come to a deeper insight of why I have that bad pattern of thinking. In other words, that would be nice. I could say, I think badly in this way. Whenever I blow something, I, um, I universalize it and I think bad about myself and I get depressed and then I'm no good for anybody. Okay, so what I ought to do now is stop on that first trigger there and say, okay, I'm starting to feel bad because I did that one stupid thing. I can't do that, got to think of good things. I try, but the one bad thing keeps coming back at me and it keeps getting bigger. I try to get around it, away from it. I try to get the positive in mind and I can't get it. Now, when I'm in that kind of situation, what I have to do, probably, is to figure out why I'm so concentrated on that one negative point. Now I have to try to get behind that. Why do I want to beat myself down like that? Maybe that's my way of imposing punishment on myself for doing that one bad thing. I'll make myself feel really terrible because I did that, uh, blew it in this one case. In other words, what I'm trying to do is get at the deeper reason why the pattern is there. Because I'm not able to just substitute. Now, if you can just substitute the positive pattern, great. Then we're home free and we get over this personal false consciousness. But if we can't do it, then we have to get at it in a deeper way. So, someone uh, comes to me and they say, well, they're lazy. You know, and I'm trying to get over this laziness. I can't seem to do it. So I have to look at it more closely. Well, where, how are you lazy? Where are you lazy? Well, I'm lazy at work. Oh, well, why is it that you're lazy at work? Well, I tell you the truth, I don't really want to be there. I hate the job. I can't stand it. No. Well, we're proud, what I'm finding out in talking to this particular fellow is he's really not lazy at all. He does all kinds of energetic things. The other job he had, he was a ball of fire. You know, generally, he's uh, very active and with it. He's only lazy, to use his word, in one circumscribed environment on this job. His real problem is the job's not right. You know, if he's not going to suck in his guts and say, Man, I'm not going to be lazy, you know, I'm going to get there and work hard, and then he tries for one day and the next day he failed, the next day he's uh, back to uh, being inert on the job. The only answer for him is somehow to change this situation, to break out of this particular job pattern. Maybe he has to get another job or try to find a different situation where he can function. Sixth, this ends, I mean there's a limited number, <laughs> finite number. Whenever I'm cleaning eaves troughs or something, I say to myself, this ends, you know. 
I learned that on the job, of doing repetitive work over and over. It ends. This number of boxes coming down this conveyor belt is finite. <laughs> and so on, serves as a corrective to my own narrow way of thinking. That is one way of getting at the value of belonging to a church. A person who doesn't want to go to mass, doesn't want to belong to a church, wants to walk in the woods, might have some very deep religious feelings, but they don't have a whole lot of help in dealing with distorted consciousness. Because they don't have the constant feedback, the constant input that forces them to see where they are. That's one of the great problems with an individualistic society, privatized way of living, thinking that I've got all the answers, I'm not sharing my burdens with anybody else, not talking about my problems with anybody else, not seeking advice, not having the community. We go our own way. We got no real leverage to break out. We got no real way of knowing how we are distorted and how false consciousness takes us over. So belonging to a church keeps preaching a higher message to us. We hear the gospel, hear the life of Jesus Christ, we see how he reacted to things. And in all of that, if we're smart, we let it cut through our consciousness and get into the center of our being and to challenge our current style and approach. Now I think, let's take the bishop's document on economics now. Now, it's going to be interesting. See, this is just coming out. It's going to be in the news for a long time now. And uh, we're going to be in a situation where we're going to be challenged with this. Now, some people will just turn it off and say they ought to not speak about economics and so on. But it would seem the wiser thing is to allow them to speak to us, to allow that message to come through and say, what about this system in which I live? Does it make total sense? Can it be improved in some way? And finally, to conclude uh, this finite numbering here, um, the, the clear thing that's needed to deal with these obstacles to spiritual growth is honesty. Self-honesty and a self-critical spirit. We've got to be not in a maudlin sense, not like I'm a crummy person, not like I'm guilty and all of that, but a healthy self-critical attitude where I am willing to say, yes, there's probably distortions in my outlook. Yes, I'm probably narrow in some ways. Yes, I have foibles that get in the way of doing a good job. Yes, false consciousness is part of my life like every other human being. Now, let me honestly try to figure out what that is. Let me be in touch with those distortions so that I can try to improve them. And this sort of morality or approach to spiritual life, the great virtue is self-honesty. So I, if I delude myself all the time, if I keep telling my spiritual director that he's crazy, that I'm not a workaholic, you know, and uh, I just haven't uh, taken a vacation for years because I don't like vacations. You know, if I keep doing that, then I'm probably going to get messed up even worse. <laughs> Sooner or later, that's the question. We're going to be honest. Are we going to let the patterns and what people say to us click in, touch us, think seriously about them or not? Or are we going to come up with what we commonly call rationalizations in order to justify ourselves and to say, I'm a neat person, perfect, got it all together, uh, I don't need to deal with this whole problem. Well, I'm going to invite you uh, at this point to turn to your neighbor and tell them their particular version of false consciousness. <laughs> uh, please be brutally honest and uh, tell them uh, exactly in what ways they are walking around with distorted attitudes. <laughs> and then we are going to disband for the rest of the evening and all go home and get over the hurt. <laughs> well, if you're not up to that, uh, why don't we take a one-to-one -one conversation for a minute, and you can make it a little more neutral in that, and just uh, talk generally about the topic and false consciousness 
and uh, see, share some ideas with the person next to you. Let's try to do that for a couple minutes here. Abused parent. You know, they say so often that people who were abused as youngsters then have, um, you know, bad patterns after that. There's a thing on the news tonight again about that of saying, they asked this the woman psychologist, well, what's the cultural ramifications of this? Is, well, we got people who were abused, sexually abused as children. They're walking around now, scarred. Uh, a lot of times they end up being the delinquents in society, the, the criminals, uh, having problems themselves in family life and so on. You know, there we've got, um, you know, we, very often we say we don't have guilt with those people. We've got ramifications of uh, the poor way they were treated as they went along. Questions about the first uh, session on false conscience? Yeah, I'm good. point. Hey, everyone hear that? Suggesting that until self-acceptance level reaches a certain uh, degree of uh, sophistication or enlightenment or of, um, no one values oneself enough, that only then could one even begin to be self-critical. <coughs> and I, I think that's, um, there's a, certainly a lot of uh, truth in that. Um, Vivian says maybe it was implicit in what was said, but I would think that it sounds to me like something good to draw out and to say more about. In fact, I think it's a very valuable point. It's sort of linked up with what I was going to say next, but uh, I was going to highlight it there. But that is that this whole thing can't work apart from feeling loved, apart from feeling accepted by God. We say that, I mean, the only thing that allows us to be honest with ourselves is the fact that we think someone cares about us anyway. That even if we uncover some messy stuff, things we don't like about ourselves, that that will still be all right. We are still acceptable in God's eyes. That seems to be the faith perspective that makes it possible. That's why, I mean, at the beginning of Mass, when we say, well, let's look at our sins and failures, I mean, I'm always thinking to myself, well, um, we don't do that in a morbid sense. That is not a put-down exercise. That's an exercise in self-honesty that can be accomplished because we believe there's forgiveness for what is sinful, that there's healing for what is wounded, and that it is possible to, to move forward in life. So I, I think the point does need to be made explicit, and. Uh, and is crucial to achieving self-honesty. And that's one of the reasons the gospel is good news is because it tells us we are accepted despite the failures, that we are loved despite the sins, that there's a God who can penetrate even our false consciousness. And that kind of belief is what spurs us on and gives us the ability, I think, to face ourselves. I think that, as Vivian's point, is extremely important that it's only at a certain level of self-acceptance or self-confidence can we start to be honest. And I don't see any way around the dilemma. Well, I would say one of the ways I do see around the dilemma is the feeling of faith, the trust in God that we're loved and can uncover whatever is sort of messy about ourselves. I appreciate that. Yes. defense mechanism? Well, I think, first of all, for the most part, the notion of false consciousness has come much more to the fore today out of the sociological tradition, and the defense mechanism is a word that comes to us out of the psychological tradition. I think that the difference is that the defense mechanism can be thought of in very private terms. That is, I got my own defense mechanisms. You know, they're mine, I build them up, I build the wall here, I can't face death here, so I keep hard and won't enter into any empathetic relationships or whatever it is. 
it, it puts emphasis on very much of a private, personal approach, as so much of psychology is done. The, the, the whole notion of false consciousness broadens it out. It enables one to do what I tried in the first part, to say that it's not just a private matter at all, it is largely cultural. It largely comes at us. In other words, our consciousness is not just formed in isolation. We pick up images from the world. Advertising shapes so much of how we feel and react to life, even without us knowing it. So it's much more of a social thing. I think it's pointing to the same personal problem, but it's suggesting that it's the cause is different directions. One puts emphasis on within, the other on the societal factors that influence us. I think that's been one of the great advances of theology in say the last decade or so has been the dialogue with sociology and our emphasis now on the way the culture influences us, that we're not isolated monads and we're not just me and God, I'm placed in a situation, I find myself thrown into a world and that world influences me so much more than we ever think. That's what I would try to get out of this. I, in other words, we're all sitting here with some sort of false consciousness now which none of us knows about. I'll tell you one way that'll become clear is that if we discover uh, people, you know, other uh, human or other life, intelligent life someplace, and they come and give us a mirror for looking at ourselves. Maybe, you know, maybe someday we'll just say, this nationalism that we're into, we're number one and uh, so on, is just totally stupid. And yet while we're living in it, it seems like that's sort of the way to go. So there's some of this that we just can't uncover because it's so pervasive. The culture just influences everything, it buttresses everything, and it, it's hard to, to step out of it. And that's why I was looking for all those clues as to how you would do it. It's the prophets who end up uh, allowing us to do that. I mean, how many good Christians had slaves? Good Christian people. I read their Bible, and it's, they read it, and it's told them that, yeah, it's good to have slaves. They're inferior. That's, uh, and from our vantage point today, we say they were in total false consciousness, and we suffer from it today because of it. But they couldn't see it. They had good people, church-going people, prayers, preachers, church leaders. Got it right in the Bible. Paul tells a slave to go back to his master. Paul could not get enough uh, distance from his own cultural milieu to understand he shouldn't have slaves at all. So it, it is so pervasive, and that's what is tricky about it. That's why you need the sharp thing. You know, that's why you need little big man where the Indians say the white people are the savages. That's the kind of thing that jolts you. You need jolts out of this. You need to, that's why prophets don't pussyfoot around. Prophets do weird things like run around naked giving their message you know, or doing things like that so they get people's attention so they can break through the, con the ordinary way of thinking and get people uh, to think more deeply about things. Got to have the prophets. Did I say that? I didn't mean it, but I go ahead. Sure, I mean, and that would be one of the most helpful things to do if one's particular brand of false consciousness is poor self-image and lack of confidence and, uh, you know, always looking at the negative about oneself. That would be one of the most important bits of feedback to get. And, it, and it's almost like that's how I feel. Drink it in. Drink in the compliments. Don't screen them. You know, let them come in, let them touch, let them penetrate, let them take them over, wallow in it. You know, lap it up. 
I think that's crucial, especially if one's particular brand of false consciousness is that. No, I mean, I think, it, it, I would say it's a minority case. I think of it another case, though, where it's just the opposite, where I think of a person uh, who is just totally distorted about his value, about his skills, about his talents, totally skewed from any objective uh, reading of it. And, uh, I mean, he, uh, he doesn't need somebody else telling him he's the most brilliant person in the world or something. I mean, he needs to hear the other side of it. But I would say, by and large, in my own experience with people, you know, the great tilt is in the other direction. You've got to drink in the positive feedback. And let it penetrate. Let it t wash over us. Let it take us over so that it can screen out, to some degree, the excessive preoccupation with the negative. Uh, is guilt ever a good thing? Question of guilt. I might let this launch me into the next section here. Um, guilt, is guilt ever a good thing? Um, yeah, well, I'm going to use that as a springboard into the next section. I maybe sort of uh, briefly here. I hope. Um, I would say the answer to Larry's question is yes, I definitely think it is. And that, in saying that, you know, I'm in great danger of messing up a few people's heads and so on. But the answer to the question is yes, and I think it's contained in the theological notion that it's possible to commit real sin. And if one indeed does really sin, then it is perfectly proper to feel guilt. And guilt will be helpful because it will help me to seek forgiveness and will be a motivating factor in overcoming the sinfulness in my life. Without the guilt, I might never come to terms with the fact that I have offended God, to use one particular metaphor here, and I won't get around to doing better. That, you know, as I say, forms sort of a framework for the, the second part of this thing because the other threat to spiritual growth really is sin and guilt. Rahner says that after you get in touch with your false consciousness, you know, and do this sober, realistic evaluation of where one's distortions are and so on, then it is time to face the possibility of sin. And now one does this with a little more emotion. Now one enters into this uh, in um, trying to establish a context of love relationship with God. Now one is trying to uh, get in touch with uh, feelings like guilt. Now well, in doing that, we clearly have to screen out neurotic guilt, false guilt, because we got so much of that going on. So I talked about my uh, teacher, Bernard Herring. One of the great things that he kept telling us all the time was how often people were imprisoned in neurotic kind of guilt. That is, they end up thinking that everything they do is a sin end up thinking that every kind of small deviation is going to damn them to hell. I think I've talked about this before in the heading of scrupulosity. That is a, an overly tender conscience where one just doesn't assess objectively. So people end up thinking, for example, reflex actions are sins, or things they can't help are sins, or minor matters are serious matters. So common example is some people will go to mass almost every week for years and they're good people eating a good life they miss one week maybe they were extra lazy or maybe they went on a trip or something and they end up thinking it's a sin and they have to mention it in confession nowhere in actuality one would think that has absolutely nothing to do with sin it's not connected in in any way with sinfulness all of that, you know, you know, that's got to be said loud and clear and over and over before we move to the next step. False guilt is destructive. A uh, scrupulous conscience is going to mess us up. 
we got to make sure we don't make create sins where they are not there. And many people do that. Many people don't distinguish carefully between breaking church laws and breaking God's law. See, people, I'd say generally, Catholics in the United States put far too much weight on church laws, give them too much prominence, and so on. And uh, don't sharply distinguish enough that from uh, what we call the divine law or God's law, the natural law that's built into our hearts. <clears throat> now, once that all would be clear, it is still true, and has to be said for any sort of full growth, that it's possible to sin. And then guilt is proper. Now, what do we mean by that? First thing that Rana reminds us of is that, that this is a mystery. We're dealing with the mystery of evil. This is not clear, um, just able to understand how this can be. We're good, made by God. God put his spirit in us. We're surrounded by his grace. How is it? that we can commit sin. How can this possibly be? There is a mysterious dimension to all this that just cannot be parsed out easily and simply. Now, try to say more positively what we might mean by this. For Rahner and uh, for all good moral theologians at times, sin is possible only if it's blameworthy activity, only if we freely choose to do something only if we know what we're doing and we decide, make a will act to go in that direction. Um, you know, a lot of the moral theologians will talk today about talking about serious sin, that you got, it, it's almost hard to commit one. You know? I mean, in Rodner's viewpoint, to commit a serious sin, you really got to get engaged. I mean, you got to really be into it. It doesn't have to be some big thing like killing people, but it's got to be engaging our freedom. It's got to be a matter of enlightened consent to what is evil, which is something that takes us away from God. So only with culpability and blameworthiness can we begin to talk about sin at all. But what would it be? What would a sinful act be like? Rahner said, makes this interesting observation. He says... To commit a sin, is a serious sin, is to put ourselves in self-contradiction. It, it is to choose against the only thing that can make us happy. It's to live in opposition to one's conscience, to go against one's ideals. You know, that's why, you know, we commonly say, you know, when we're guilty, we can't look in the mirror hard to face ourselves. I think one of the signs of, of, of this is fatigue. To live in self-contradiction means we're always battling ourselves, always sort of having to take those ideals and stuff them down and pretend they're not there. Got a lot of repressing to do then. And I think it ends up causing very often sort of a fatigue of the spirit, a sort of lassitude about life. Um, let's say it another way of what uh, sin might be. Sin is to fail to live in reality, to fail to deal with what is actual, with what is real. It's a, it's a, it's a failure to let go of our own autonomy. To be in sin means I'm going to build my own world. I'm going to go my own way. I'm going to be egocentric. I'm going to screen out other voices. That means, that's become a common word in theology these days, it means that to change my whole direction in life, say I'm going in the right direction, I want to be good, I'm trying to be a good person, I want to do my job right, I want to move towards God, be in tune with God. To sin means to take that whole option for good and to turn it around and make my fundamental option, my key story, 
to be one that centers on myself, selfishness, sin of all kinds. That would be to change one's fundamental option. That's something that we might mean by mortal sin. Well, all that's <clears throat> trying to get us in touch with where the threat might be. I mean, to make sure we know what we're talking about. The threat to the spiritual life is not something that's going to just happen without sort of any uh, warning. It's not going to just be a reflex action. It can only be if we truly grab hold in life and make a clear-cut decision against God and for evil in some way. Now, Ronald makes an interesting observation. He says there's really two things we ought to be on alert for. One is less likely, and he says that's the catastrophe. It is that it's possible to think in one's life that one's going to blow it. One's going to really decide for evil and mess up one's life. And he says we do have to live with that possibility. He says something, I think, in the quote, we are menaced by the possibility of sin. He doesn't mean that in a morbid sense or to make us afraid or anything, but he thinks we do have to recognize that that's possible. I suppose we look around sometimes, we think that that's what people do. They mess up their whole life in some way. <clears throat> but Rahner's emphasis is elsewhere. He talks about the more present danger of falling into mediocrity, of not caring anymore, of slipping into greater selfishness, of sort of uh, just not taking hold to stand up for what is right, slipping away. He said, maybe that's where the danger is for most of us in life. Not the catastrophic mistake, the big sin in a way that's going to mess up our whole life, but just this business of uh, slipping into mediocrity, not caring anymore, not wanting to respond, not listening to the voice, not wanting to become a better person anymore, settling in, being on the plateau, saying, I'm not going to climb that mountain anymore not responding to the call to greater growth. Maybe that's the kind of threat that we ought to look out for. Next point in looking at the threats. And that is <clears throat> the importance of being in touch with what we've traditionally called venial sin. I guess I've said this a lot, but one of Ronner's big points is don't call venial sins light sins, as though they're not serious. Precisely the small sins are the things that could end up affecting our personality, changing our character, suddenly making us the kind of person we don't want to be. Someone gossips a little bit here, lets himself go, gossips a lot. Before long, one is in a situation of just being a gossip. One naturally gossips. That's all there is to it. And one could never say that I sat down someday and said, I think I'll be a gossip, or I'm going to really, uh, you know, I'm going to show God and gossip about people. It's not like that. It's just one decision after another, small things that accumulate, and someday we wake up and say, I am a gossip. That's what I just do. My tongue is, is just loose that way. And that would be something, perhaps, that uh, one would uh, try to look at more seriously. In fact, the venial sins, we could say, could reinforce the false consciousness. Maybe, you know, that we could play that off with the first part of what I was saying. I would say, maybe it's precisely because I've become too lazy, because I won't be honest with myself, I won't listen to my spiritual director, got this venial sin, here of a certain pride because I won't listen to him when he tells me something I think I know better before long that thing keeps going keeps going and you have no way to break through the false consciousness venial sin could reinforce the distorted attitudes and keep us from growth again and finally trying to compress here and give us some time that all the talk about sin is always needs to be encompassed by grace. And this is a point Vivian made so well before, I think, that is that the 
that you can't talk about this whole thing without that. Now, I know what happens from experience. People don't like the last 15 minutes of this lecture. I know that ahead of time. I know that there's people in the room here who are struggling to free themselves from false guilt. I know there's people who are just trying to get over neurotic feelings of being down on themselves. I know there's people who got poor self-image. And in a sense, they don't need to hear that. They need to hear all the positive message. I know that. And I don't want in any way to uh, interfere with people's growth that way. But when you're looking at spiritual growth and to where you want to get to someday, to be like the saints, to be like the good people, to have it really together, it seems to me it has to include the ability to say, yes, I am potentially a sinner. To be able to face that and to be able to respond to God's love and try to improve on it. Because it is possible to live in self-contradiction. And uh, it is possible to be afflicted with what we have called venial sins that retard our growth. Simply, it's possible to do things in life that are against our better self, that are against our growth, and we know it. And we wake up someday and say, that was damn stupid. <clears throat> I shouldn't have done that. That's retarded where I'd like to be. I'm less of a person than I ought to be. That really is clear to me. We have to come to terms. I'm flashing on a situation. <clears throat> oh, you know, you can never judge sin. You know, no other person can judge it. But I can just look at this situation. This young woman was hurt by her husband terribly, and she sat there and told me she was going to destroy him. It's almost like something you'd hear on soap operas, in a way, only it's real. This young woman, her whole system was poisoned. The system was poisoned. She, in the rest of her life, was going to devote herself to destroying this man. She didn't care if she went to jail. She didn't care if she, uh, if she um, died. She didn't care what happened. Like she probably she thought something like that would happen. She was going to destroy that man. And then listen to this woman say, young woman, say that. You know, and I kept pleading with her over months of time that she was poisoning herself, she was hurting herself, that she would never move forward in life. And she was in the grip in the grip of evil powers. Someone asked me at lunch today, he says, well, what, you know, a psychiatrist, you know, what do you think about a psychiatrist? Their suggestion was that atheistic psychiatry cannot deal with that. It can't deal with what we call sin, or what we call the residue of original sin, what we call demonic forces. I mean, this woman, I just to be in her presence was to be on edge. No, that's one of the clearest ways I've had of knowing what speck meant in uh, People of the Lie, in that odd book. No doubt everyone heard Ernie Sibley and I on the radio talking about that program, um, uh, about that topic. People of the Lie, well, I mean, it's, it felt that. It, it's to know in a sense that it is possible just to seemingly to go towards evil. Now that is an extreme case, but you know, I say it to highlight this fact that you've got to factor this into the human situation. If you end up just screening it out or not wanting to talk about whatever that means, then you're into the world of atheistic psychiatry, I think, which ends up being limited and not knowing what it's going to do for people like that. And I see, finally, that the last point becomes the most crucial, and that is, wherever sin exists, grace more abounds. We can only be honest if it's in terms of God's grace. And we have to believe that God can overcome that kind of demonic force. Now, I don't know what's happening to that young woman. You know, a lot of times I think of her. I wish I could help her in some way. You know, but maybe I have the hope that the time will come when the spirit will break through that hardness, when the poison will be drawn out of her system, and where she can return to some normal existence and not let this man who did indeed hurt her badly and mess her head up entirely. 
it would seem that that's what you would want to get. My hope would be that if the truth of the gospel is there, that that can happen. I believe it can happen. I've seen it happen in other cases. That's my kind of way of saying that where sin exists, grace more abounds. And that's the only way I think we can end up dealing with that obstacle to growth. So what have we been about this whole night here? How am I going to become more fully alive? How am I going to improve in my life? And the major bulk of it is I've got to find the distortions in my own thinking. I've got to let other people help me do that, the community, the church, the prophets. And I've got to feel as though I'm accepted by God so that I can deal with those distortions. And I also have to deal honestly, openly, with the fact that sin is a possibility in life. And when it happens, then maybe the thing to do is to say, God... I'm sorry, I'm weak, sorry, I'm going to try again with your help. I think maybe that's uh, where we would like to be. <clears throat> Let's um, see if we got comments and questions here. Fill-ins. Can I, unless I forget something? I know I'm going to get time to that, but um, we have a lecture coming up in here Sunday night. Gregory Baum is here talking about ethics and economics. Gregory Baum is a great summarizer. He's a very fine theologian. And uh, I think with this, all this interest in ethics and economics today, this is the place to be Sunday night, 730. I've got flyers here. Anybody can uh, take one profitably and put it on a bulletin board someplace or bring a friend. Uh, I would appreciate it. 730 right in here. That's uh, so I didn't forget it. I'm looking for feedback to the last section here. Questions, fill-ins? I hope everyone heard that because I think it's an important question. That is, what about what we commonly call guilt when we fail to live up to what our family would expect or the people we serve or our kids or something like that? Now, it seems to me there's two things that are important to say about that. One is we can easily be involved there in neurotic guilt. So let's say here's a mother who served her family very well and always taken care of them. They move out. They want her on a particular occasion. She can't be there. And uh, for good reason, she's got to attend to herself. And if she ends up feeling guilty about that, then that's a false guilt. That's a, a neurotic kind of guilt. It does, she shouldn't feel good. It's an inappropriate emotion. She should be told that isn't a sin. Don't feel guilty. You know, you had every right to stay at home and not be there in that case. She needs to hear that. So we can take of a lot of situations like that where it just simply makes no sense to end up feeling guilty because uh, there's nothing we can do about it because people are making false expectations about it. You know? So if uh, somebody uh, says uh, to me they don't want me out on the golf course or in a bar having a beer or something because they don't think priests should be doing that, shouldn't be in the bar having a drink, um, well then that's their problem. I mean, if I let them make me feel guilty about that, then, then I've got a neurotic false guilt. I have to think clearly about that. So when you think of all kinds of examples, a teacher goes in the classroom, she does the best job she can, she tries to take care of the kids, she's got 26 kids here, one of them she doesn't really attend to as much as she would like on a given occasion. Well, she can't help that. She feels guilty about that. That's a false guilt. Uh, you can't do that because it's simply asking too much. So that's one part of the answer that I would say. However, and I'm really glad for this question, I think it, it's important, that is, there is something else that is at stake here, and that is the pure sense that in general, we don't live up to something. 
that in that just by and large there's a gap between what we think we're called to be and what we really are. Put in theological terms, it's a general feeling like we're not responding to God's call as good as we should, as well as we could uh, possibly do it. That there's a gap between performance and ideal. That we often call guilt. That is sort of a pervasive kind of guilt. That's what many people are walking around with generally. They're sort of weighed down by it day after day. Now that is important to distinguish out. That seems to me to be what I call just normal creaturehood. That's a normal way of being. That is just, my statement is join the human race. Join the rest of us who feel that same gap between ideal and performance, who feel in various ways let people down. That should not be called guilt. That isn't guilt. There's, that's a normal, natural creature feeling that it's not possible to ever get over. That's life, man. That's the gap between uh, uh, what we would like to be and what we really are. It's the gap between uh, the highest ideals we want for ourselves and how we live on a day-to-day -day basis. It's the gap between being a creature and being in the presence of the great God who's incomprehensible, inexhaustible, who's far above us. You can't get away from that. Now, a lot of people walk around thinking that's abnormal and making too much out of it and feeling bad about it. Rotter says what you got to do with that is embrace it. That's interesting. Rotter says you got to embrace that. That's the reality. I don't know if that ended up in the quote here or not. I don't know if it's exactly in there in the prayer, maybe or so. I don't remember. Embrace the. Anyway, that's just creaturehood. That's um, and we got to. The usual thing is to shy away from that because it makes us gives us angst, anxiety. That's, and that's what gnaws at the guts very often. It makes us feel guilty. And I'd say it's just how we need to embrace that feeling. That's life. That's me. That's why I like to joke about it a lot of times, to make people laugh about it, because it's just a human situation. Join the group. The one thing we know about all of us in the room here. We're creatures in relationship to the Creator. And that makes us in a way, I say this so often, Kierkegaard wrote an article, essay, in which he called the edification found in realizing that before God you are always in the wrong. Now see, people hear that, and some people will walk out feeling guilty. That's right, I'm a crummy person. That's right, everyone else is better than me. Kierkegaard was right. I'm the model for Kierkegaard. Always in the wrong. I do everything wrong. I can't even get the ice cubes out right. You know, I do everything wrong. <laughs> do everything wrong. But what Rodder says is, no, no, embrace it. Embrace it. That's the line. That's the way it is. That's it. Let's laugh about it. Have fun with being preachers. I was sitting at night saying that some person there had trouble with this. They think they've lost their whole ability to play or to laugh. We need to laugh when we sense the distance between ourselves and the Creator. And that's maybe how we break down a little sense of humor needed in, uh, in dealing with that kind of situation. So, there, let's have this thing how we kinds of guilt in answer to Larry's question. One is clearly a neurotic guilt. And I think I, I did something wrong as a sin when it has nothing to do with sin. Second kind of guilt is what we call existential guilt or ontological guilt. This is the creature feeling that I'm describing. And what we got to do with that is embrace it, laugh about it, be happy about it, pray to God over it, hand it over to God, let go of it. I'm not God. Whoopee. And the third kind of guilt is real, helpful, helpful guilt when I have actually sinned and need to admit.